it's it's an absolute pleasure to introduce um, my my wonderful colleague and workshop co-organizer Simon Rasmussen, um, who is um, at the NF Center for Protein Research at the University of Copenhagen, and also of course the NNFC at the Broad Institute. Um, and Simon will be giving a talk on integrating patient level multiomics data using deep learning methods. Yeah, so thanks a lot for the introduction and also for having me, even though I was also part of the organizing committee. <clears throat> My lab works on uh, uh, within uh, uh, computational biology. So as most people here, uh, we do bioinformatics methods development and data analysis. We work with uh, quite a lot of different types of data. Um, and what I will talk about today is two papers that are within these fields here. So one on like large scale human genomics, um, and then another paper, which is mean, uh, mainly on data integration uh, and uh, deep learning. And also, as like as mentioned yesterday, please just uh, ask your questions. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to um, take them while we also do the uh, the talk. Um, so the topic um, that I wanted to kind of address is this multimodal data integration. I think yesterday we heard also some examples of how we how um, people are integrating data on the very like um, chromatin uh, level. Um, but I think like I think we really need to start or we really or people are, and people are also doing multimodal data integration because we need to uh, solve some uh, of these uh, quite big challenges uh, and fundamental uh, questions within biology. One of these is also what the uh, center at the broad is um, is working on is these uh, genetic, mechanisms of disease. So how does the variant actually affect uh, an individual um, uh, in terms of uh, a certain disease or trait? Um, and then of course, also within the health and clinical space where there's a lot of um, uh, possibilities of uh, uh, Im improving uh, various um, treatments uh, there. And, and to be able to do this, I think we really need uh, so, and to be able to actually have a very good uh, multimodal data integration, I think we need to be able to learn from all the data modalities that we want, uh, want to integrate. And a solution for this, uh, and I think also not only in my group, but in many groups uh, around the world, um, is to try to use uh, deep learning to do the integration. And I just here, I mean, uh, I have some examples from my lab. I will not talk about all of them, um, but just briefly mentioned here that, I mean, we we can basically divide it in two different uh, approaches. So one is supervised and another one is unsupervised slash self-supervised learning, uh, where we, uh, I will talk about here within the supervised learning, where we are basically learning from uh, labels we have on, our, uh, on the data. I'll uh, talk about a paper we just had accepted this morning, actually, uh, where we are integrating uh, genomics with other types uh, of data. And then I'll talk about um, um, uh, in the second half of the talk, I'll talk about how we're using unsupervised learning to integrate data uh, and to uh, learn from uh, uh, across many different types of data. So if we think about the, the first uh, problem um, or the um, supervised approach first. So what we have been focusing on or trying to work on is to try to start from the genome because we, I mean, the genome is the basis of um, human biology. And um, what we're interested in is the uh, influence uh, of the genome on various uh, outcomes. This could be disease risk, so uh, or uh, disease or disorder risk. Um, this could be treatment responses. So how likely are you to uh, respond to a certain drug or to a certain treatment? And then also, um, and I have a little bit about that in, in this part here, also related to biomarkers. So can we actually, um, from the genetics, can we actually identify individuals that have, uh, or um, uh, where uh, the biomarkers are, the level of the biomarker in the blood or in the urine is um, changed um, due to the um, genome of that individual. And of course, we can look at the genome, and I think most of this talk is actually on that because it's actually not, it's a quite a, uh, a big challenge to develop a deep learning model that can actually like read all this data, but that's what we've done. But we also, uh, and, and, and that's in this talk, we try to integrate biomarker data 
Uh, and in the uh, next talk, we are basically talking about omics data. But we also have work ongoing on um, registry data and also uh, starting to work on these uh, electronic health record data as well. So <clears throat> most people, or I think uh, many people have heard about these polygenic risk scores. We basically from the genome, you want to uh, try to predict what's the risk of a certain individual in terms of um, a certain outcome, uh, disease or uh, similar. And basically what we are trying to do here is basically, I mean, both make a polygenic risk score if we're only uh, working with genomes, but basically also try to make some kind of outcome score uh, where we integrate the uh, genetics data uh, with uh, other data. And so the data we've been working on, and I think as many people, uh, are doing as well is the fantastic uh, UK Biobank data set. So <clears throat> I'm not go super much into detail, I'll just say here that we worked with the uh, genotype data, meaning we have 500,000 SNPs across the, uh, the genome. And um, <clears throat> there's approx also approximately 500,000 indivi um, individuals in the uh, UK Biobank. So, and it, um, this basically turns out to be a really big matrix that if we take the 500,000 individuals and 500,000 SNPs, then it's actually 250 billion data points. So it's actually quite a big a challenge to be able to um, model um, on this data. So um, uh, uh, what we then actually did was then, uh, this is really led by Arno from my group, he's really uh, been amazing in making this possible here, um, is that we wanted to only uh, not only learn from genomics data, but also other types of data. So uh, the way we approach this is then that uh, Anna made, um, we can say like a deep learning model or a phenotype or a feature extractor from each that can work on each of these data sets here. Um, and um, so basically uh, you, we have a, a neural network that can learn from a certain type of data. And then depending on which types of data we have available, uh, we then train, or then uh, the model then trains a, um, in integration uh, module um, um, a neural network that's then able to learn from all these, uh, from, for instance, the uh, genetics data and the multi-omics data at, at the same time, and then use that um, and then come up with some kind uh, of score um, for this patient or for this trait. And, and one cool thing about, like, um, how or that we're using these uh, neural networks to model this um, genetics data is that we can uh, also learn non-additive effects, so not only um, linear uh, effects in the uh, data. <clears throat> so uh, the way we approach this, so here first for uh, working with uh, only the uh, genotype data, is that we um, came up with this kind of and layer that's in between a convolutional neural network layer and a, a fully connected layer, which we call this locally connected layer. So if you had like a fully connected network, then you would be, then each of the input neurons would be con um, connected to each of the neurons here in the next layer. But what we kind of borrow here is from the uh, convolutional world where we then only um, connect uh, neurons here with uh, 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 neurons in the next layer that are local to it, so not to all other neurons. And then <clears throat> um, what we can do is we can then stack these uh, these layers here, so both in the, the both the, along the genome. So here, imagine we have five hundred thousand um, inputs here from uh, uh, from the five hundred thousand SNPs. Basically, it, it would be um, stacking up here, and then of course we also need to stack them uh, in in the depth so that we can keep kind of funneling the information from each of these layers uh, further down um, until we get in um, until we get uh, to a representation that's uh, more um, uh, manageable and can you say I, a little bit more about the motivation for that architecture Simon um, yeah um, so basically so uh, I think I also have it a little bit on the next slide but but okay. basically so so we started out uh, using uh, convolutional neural networks because yeah. I mean you thought that would work fine but it turns out it is actually not that good I mean it can learn but mm -hmm. there's a, a limitation to the uh, amount of filters or uh, kernels that you can have I see yeah and if you use like a, a fully connected layer it basically just explodes right because then you have Oh, in certainly. Yeah. You, and you want, maybe you want some notion of locality is like, you actually do want that. Exactly. Because we do have this like LD structure as well. Right. right so exactly. 
yeah so we, we kind of wanted to have that so so that's uh, basically um how we came up with this and it's, i guess it is it's a very different data structure than you have for the the full sequences that are used for example in the models we saw in angel's talk yesterday definitely um, here they're just snips they're not they're exactly not, right yeah 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 yes yeah so here uh, basically here they're just like uh, snips with uh, various amounts of uh, distance between us and we're not like basically modeling each space we're only uh, modeling the snips that we have measured and i think it's actually a super interesting uh question if how can we then actually model if we have the entire genome right and uh, we 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 haven't really tried that but that's actually something that we are uh quite interested in um so, so but Arnold, question, yeah have you considered like using visible neural networks where you instead of locally connected uh how you have it now but that you use gene annotations or other prior biological uh, knowledge i think that's a super good idea and i think there's been like um some um, uh, exams of that i mean we haven't done it um i think arno is a little bit reluctant to kind of try to add in like this prior knowledge but i think uh, i think it's probably the um something that we will uh, try in in the future because i think that's also really inter uh, inter uh, interesting as, as well we also thought about i mean connecting these um in the ld space as well so you could kind of have um ld as a block or uh, also um uh, topolo topologically associated domains as the blocks right but that's also a little bit tricky because um that will be different between the different cell types as well so so that's um uh, but I think genes is a very good um, uh, possibility. I think I'll skip this one here, um, but basically saying that we are actually able to uh, train this just on a single GPU. I think that was also a lot of engineering from on our side. Um, and so we basically trained um, for 400,000 individuals, eight traits um, in only a, a little bit more than uh, 30 hours. So I think that's actually pretty cool. Um, so if you look a little bit on like the performance of this, then uh, so here I have the rock AUC. Um, these are just eight traits we selected from the UK Biobank. We tested on 200 traits, but of course we cannot make um, figures with all of them. So here I basically just compare, or here we compare uh, the blue one here, which is a lasso implementation, the GLN here, uh, which is the um, uh, our model with the uh, locally connected layers. Then we have the... Um, fully connected layer here in green, and then the CNNs in red. And you see that, I mean, unfortunately, the GLN is actually not that much better than just a linear model, uh, but that's something I will come back to. Um, but we do see that for most of the cases, uh, the GLN model is actually better than the MLP. Uh, and if, in all of the cases, it's better than the uh, convolutional neural network. And similarly, we can look at, um, uh, I mean, so we can look at what's the contribution of each SNP, and we get these kind of Manhattan-like plots of the um, SNP uh, uh, contributions. Here, for instance, for type 1 diabetes, we see here there's a large uh, contribution here from the M MHC on uh, chromosome 6, which is also uh, what one would um, um, uh, expect. And so as, so, um, so what we, as we show, at least in the paper, and what I try to say here is that, that we... Um, that we think that is actually learning uh, uh, biological relevant uh, SNPs. Second, we also uh, uh, try to test or train and test on mixed ancestries. And um, so this is of course bias, uh, um, problematic because there's not a lot of um, individuals with or some of the ancestries in, in the UK Biobank have very little uh, or very few uh, individuals, but uh, it seems that we can actually somehow we are uh, actually somehow able to um, um, uh, to uh, train across them and also learn across these uh, mixed ancestries. But we haven't actually gone more into detail with that, but I think that's actually quite uh, interesting as well. Um, <clears throat> another thing that we also needed to investigate was, can we actually transfer this? It's fine, we can train it in the uh, UK Biobank, but can we actually also apply this to another data set? So here we... Uh, took the intersection uh, of SNPs um, between the UK Biobank and the Danish blood donor study. Uh, so we trained the models in uh, in, uh, in the UK Biobank, and we could then apply them to the uh, Danish blood donor study. We didn't do any correction for LD or anything, uh, but we see here that they actually transfer quite well. Um, it's a little bit more difficult here for the uh, categorical traits, 
but that can also be because of the uh, definition um, of the uh, um, of the traits themselves um, and how they are uh, recorded in the uh, UK Biobank and the uh, Danish uh, blood donor study. So <clears throat> that was uh, all on the genome, right? But what about if we add more data? And I think there's actually quite a lot more data coming out now um, in the UK Biobank and we're very interested in, in uh, trying to model on that. But uh, what we had available at the time when we did the work, we, uh, there was these uh, 34 biomarkers measured in blood and I think in the urine uh, for almost all of the individuals. So we thought, what about adding them into the uh, model, right? So we had this nice model that can learn uh, across the different um, modalities. And so what we did was simply we said, okay, if you have a blood sample taken before your uh, diagnosis, then we are, then we can model on you. And but of course, if you have your sample taken after your diagnosis, then um, uh, then we will not um, um, uh, include you in in the modeling because then it's uh, uh, basically uh, leaking information into the um, into the labels. Um, and um, uh, and of course, I mean, so within the UK Biobank, I think there are also some issues with, uh, I mean, how the how the labels are, but but I think that's the best we could do. Um, uh, and and so what we um, what we find here, so this is again the same eight traits as we looked at before. Uh, and here, then here I have the two orange ones here. These are the genotypes. Um, so uh, only working on on the genotype data. The blue, no, the green one here is on the biomarkers alone, and the integrated here is on the biomarkers and the uh, genotype data. And so the first thing we see is that, well, it uh, increases the performance for almost more, uh, all traits to include the biomarker measurements. And I think this also makes sense. They are biomarkers for a reason, um, but also that the biomarkers themselves are actually very powerful on their own. And only for like a, a few of the traits to actually see that the genetics actually improve. And I think here, I mean, the improvement is actually not so big, right? Um, and this, I think, can have uh, various um, reasons. I'm, one thing is really that the, um, uh, the, the biomarkers are so that uh, they are sampled much closer to the event uh, compared to the genetic, which is basically uh, constant, right? Um, and then also uh, it depends on the genetic component of the trait and so on. So it's not as simple as that, but we do see that there might be some that at least uh, using the biomarkers are very powerful. And hopefully, uh, for instance, here for um, for this trait here, we actually see that it uh, it uh, improves uh, adding in the genetics. So it's, I think it's it's it it's kind of like um, a little bit more complicated than just saying that it's better uh, or worse. <clears throat> Then I want to just jump a little bit back to the uh, uh, genetics data itself, because I think this connects to the next part of my talk. Um, and that is that like with these um, uh, nonlinear uh, models, we, or with these deep learning models, we can model these nonlinear effects. And so we, of course, ran uh, our method on all the uh, traits in, uh, in the UK Biobank, or all the diseases. Uh, and the only places, and here again, here the Blue is the linear model, and the orange is then the uh, nonlinear uh, GLM model. And we see here that for these many of these uh, immune disorders, we actually saw that the uh, GLN was had a, a, an improvement compared to the linear models. And uh, <clears throat> this is really because what we are finding here is these um, uh, nonlinear effects and also in interactions. I'll try to just briefly explain or show here an example from uh, type 1 diabetes uh, here. So. Here we have two SNPs here, so R is uh, 927 and R is uh, 384 and so on. Um, and we see like uh, this is the number of uh, alleles that we have, and this is the effect the SNP has on, on whether you have a, a type 2 diabetes or not. So what we clearly see here for this SNP here is we see that the AA uh, allele has uh, um, an increased risk uh, of uh, type 1 diabetes for this allele. And we also see that this is not a linear line here, right? So see here, it's not, not a linear trend. So meaning that here there's uh, clearly this um, nonlinear effect. And similarly goes, uh, similar goes here for this uh, other SNP here, where you see that there's actually, that this is also clearly also uh, not nonlinear. Um, and then 
we we can also estimate what's the effect of the interaction. So what's the added effect of having either um, or of having a, a combination of these SNPs? And I, this is maybe a little bit complicated, but I just try to uh, indicate here. So here I have this. Uh, here I have basically the genotypes here uh, of the RS927 SNP here. So CCCA and AA. And here we see how they are, how the risk is um, um, modulated by which uh, SNP it is that you uh, have for this uh, RS384 SNP, which is indicated out here by colors. So what you see here is that if you have the AA here in this SNP, uh, and you have the blue one here, the GG, so this one here, then you have an, an added risk here um, compared to uh, if you uh, compare to just adding the risk of these two. Uh, and if you then have either the, um, the GA or the AA, then you actually have an added or like an increased, um, increased decrease, decrease risk. Yeah, that was not, uh, that was maybe a little bit difficult to understand, but then you basically have an added effect uh, that uh, is, is not explained by the, the effect of the two uh, SNPs alone. I think this is also kind of cool that we can find this, but <clears throat> I also say that, I mean, we didn't find as much as we had thought. And I think if we had spoken with uh, more uh, uh, geneticists before we started, I think they could have informed of, uh, us on that. And I think that one of the reasons are really that, I mean, these are very complex phenotypes, right? And the one phenotype might not just be like one, uh, just like one very well-defined phenotype, but can actually be a collection of many, several different phenotypes. They may manifest at different ages. So you might, have individuals in your data set that have the that have the signal from the genomes but don't have the um, phenotype yet. And there's then again, this can be contribution from all across the genome, and there can also be a, a plyo, a plyo, plyotropy as well. So we thought about we had these biomarkers, right? And maybe we can um, try to uh, model on these because these are in principle like more simple, right? So they are not like uh, confounded by coming from different organs uh, and so on, or at least not as much as these uh, complex phenotypes. And so uh, what I, um, so uh, basically we try to do the same thing. We try to use uh, our models to model the abundance of these biomarkers in the blood on the urine. And this is basically what I show here. Um, and you see, I think maybe it's a little bit difficult to see, for instance, here for lipoprotein A. See here that if we model using uh, the uh, neural networks, we get an increased R squared compared to if you model using the uh, linear models. And similarly here for uh, uh, two of the uh, uh, beta-rubin measurements, also here for um, uh, APO, uh, APOB and cholesterol, and also for LDL. So it seems that we can actually try to, over here we can actually identify um, um, like more of this uh, uh, non-linearity. And, and some of this is from being better at modeling the covariates, but some of it is also because there's these um, non-linear um, effects, both in terms of dominance, as I saw before, but also these interactions. So this concludes the first part of my talk. Um, basically, uh, we, we can model these uh, genetics data. Um, we can we have a framework where we can integrate data? It's I think it's going to be interesting to see how much gain we can get from the genomics. I think the, there might be something to have. Uh, and then as other people have also used, I think it's going to be very interesting to make these kind of um, uh, phenotype predictors or these simple phenotype predictors and then use them um, to predict more uh, complex phenotypes in kind of like have a trend for learning uh, approach. Okay, so that was my supervised part. Then I go on to the unsupervised part, and I don't know how much time I spend. I think I'm okay with time. And please just go ahead and uh, and. I have, well, I have a question. Um, yeah. Did you did you find any um, of the uh, any other examples of epistasis that were not HLA? Not for the uh, not for the um, diseases. No, that we didn't. For the biomarkers, we do. Oh, you do. That's interesting. And so presumably that it's a bit easier because they're also a bit less polygenic, right? I mean, my, my intuition Definitely. has always been that it's very hard for complex human traits 
to find any evidence of epistasis, probably not, not because it's probably not there at all, but because um, there are so many effects and they're so small that in some sense, the linear approximation captures almost all of the population level variation anyway. So exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, okay. So the, so the bio, the, 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 the traits, the um, biomarkers are probably less, they're, they're less polygenic, right? The, 100%. Yeah, exactly. And there's the fewer larger effects. Yeah. And, there, and you do see evidence of interactions between them. That's, I mean, that's already quite interesting though. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, this unsupervised business has, we have been doing that for quite a long time in my group is actually how I first ended up doing uh, mis uh, not machine learning, but deep learning. And so we published some papers on where, we, where we've been using that. We've been using on supervised deep learning to integrate data uh, and then to also use that in integration to do some clustering and analysis of this. So we both on microbiome data and also on some um, uh, combining genetics with uh, various uh, registry data. Um, but the recent, the most recent stuff we did is on where we basically went further on with this. So instead of only using it for integration and clustering, we also, we kind of added, uh, we started using the actual generative, generative part of the models and combining that with, with what we call um, virtual perturbations. This is really Rosa from my group and also Ricardo from a group that has really been working uh, hard on that. And uh, Rosa is now um, in uh, uh, Barcelona um, for a postdoc. So <clears throat> what this um, project is about here is about integration uh, of really of very uh, multimodal data. This is a type two diabetes cohort. Um, we have almost 800 patients uh, that have been newly diagnosed with type two diabetes. Um, we have various types of omics data uh, from genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and the gut microbiome. We have all kinds of clinical phenotypes, uh, which I think is actually really, really uh, impressive here for this amount of uh, individuals. Uh, also of note, we also have the which drugs they're taking um, and how long they have been on these um, treatments. Then we also have, uh, and then we also have in, Envi uh, environmental data as well. And so we kind of took all these features and divided them into um, categorical and uh, continuous features. Um, and so here we have a total of around 450. So we selected SNPs we didn't. So here we didn't model from the entire um, genome, uh, but we selected SNPs that were already uh, associated with uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, else it would have been like yeah hundreds of thousands um and then we uh, uh combine these to a total of around um almost uh, 9000 features so why did why did you choose not to just use all the snips uh, is that for computation reasons or yeah it is yeah exactly okay. because i mean I, um it would be very uh, challenging to model that because okay right. then we would both have to learn like which snips are important but there's so many snips and it i mean so we basically took the easy way out there right but but um so oh, we yeah. it could actually be interesting cool. to combine the two approaches in a way and and yeah yeah i mean it'd be interesting to see how much uh, better signal you get if you include everything right and uh, yeah. whether it's actually worth it yeah yeah that's also my doubt right is it worth it and is it doable right so Okay, so, and what we knew from our previous work that I had on the previous slide was that we could use the VAEs to integrate data. We had learned that. We could use them to uh, integrate various types of data and learn from uh, that data. But here we still, this was like a challenge. We was bigger challenge. I mean, we had a lot of different types of data. We also had a lot of missing data and a lot of biases. This is like a European cohort. Uh, so they are collected uh, at five or six different centers across Europe. Um, and we also wanted to learn, like, what's the information across, or can we um, extract information across the different um, um, data set? And we came up with this uh, methodology called MOVE, uh, which we call, this is for multi-omics variation also encoder. And this is the one that will, you can try if you want to uh, in the workshop uh, later today. And I really highly uh, recommend that both Mark and Ricardo has been working really um, a lot on trying to make a super good um, uh, exercise. So <clears throat> what we are doing here, I just I just want briefly want to in, um, introduce this concept of uh, autoencoders, which is like one way of doing unsupervised deep learning. 
and just it'll be very brief here. So basically, this is a neural network. We have inputs uh, or layers here, um, and we have an input layer, we have an output layer, and then we have a layer here in the middle, which is this bottleneck. And what we are trying to do here, or how we train these models, is we try to minimize the difference between what comes in and what comes out. And this basically forces the network to learn like a representation here, we call it a latent representation, that is what is commonly used for analysis. And this is also what we have been using for uh, the analysis uh, and clustering in our previous papers. And of course, there are many different um, varieties of these, and we are using uh, one variety that's called a variational autoencoder, but there are like um, lots, I mean, I think probably more than 100, or maybe even more than 100 uh, different um, uh, types of these autoencoders. So basically what we do here, we have our data that we then um, want to learn, or we then want to uh, create a VAE model that can then learn this data. And because we are here, we are doing unsupervised learning, we are not interested in transferring the model somewhere else. We are only interested in learning uh, to uh, training the model and then applying the model to the same data. So what we um, do first here is that we try, we have this uh, methodology to, I don't, we're not going into detail, but to set up like what should the architecture, how should the network look like uh, so that we can make a, uh, we can train a VE model that can actually learn the data. Second, we make, um, we do some analysis here of the latent space and the third part here, which took us quite some time to come up with, which is these like uh, virtual perturbation uh, we use to identify uh, cross omics uh, associations. And um, okay, so first, so uh, we want to see can we actually learn? Uh, can we actually learn the um, learn the data using uh, 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 and uh, a VAE? And what so I show here this is the reconstruction accuracy. So this is how accurate the reconstruction is. So coming out of the autoencoder at the end um, uh, on a held out uh, test part, uh, test set part of the data. And you see here for each of the different data sets is actually really good at um, reconstructing the individual data sets. Similarly, we can look at the uh, latent representation. So here, this is a U map of the latent representation. Um, so, and here each dot here is a, a patient or a person. Um, we see here that it's one kind of a big blob. So it's kind of like a newly, or it's like a, a, a con continuum. So it's not like separate clusters here. Um, and we also here, we call it the, uh, the individuals according to the insulin uh, uh, sen sensitivity. We see here that the model seems to learn some kind of signature here that these individuals up here have in general lower uh, insulin sensitivity and these ones down here, they have uh, higher. And <clears throat> so this is really cool because it, it, it shows us that the model is learning something about the clinical um, aspects of these patients. Um, we also show that we can reduce the effect of missingness. I don't have it here in this uh, presentation. We show that we can reduce the effect of confounders. And when we try to do similar types of analysis uh, or trying to look for these clinical signatures in the raw data, PSA or UMAP, then we find little signal. So <clears throat> this was really cool. We now we have an, um, uh, a model that can actually integrate the data. So it can learn the data, right? Um, but, and what this... Simon, what, what was your latent dimension ultimately that you settled on? And did you do any kind of hyperparameter optimization to, to choose that? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so um, yes, we um, uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, hyperparameter optimizations. And so I think for this model here, it's a, the latent space is 150 neurons. Okay. I so you curious. have a lot of um, capacity uh, to be able to learn it. Yeah, yeah. Is there any, uh, have you thought at all about possibility that a lower dimension would maybe not have as good objective performance but potentially be more interpretable or or yeah yeah so we we, we basically we tested we also benchmarked i mean further on we benchmarked also uh, different sizes of the networks right and um so it was kind of um we what we look at both at the uh, reconstruction accuracy we look at how uh, stable it is as well right so if i retrain a model does the same individual, uh, is it, um, I mean, does it, 
uh, I, it, is it in the same area of the latent space, right? Because if they, if you train a model on, I mean, uh, the same model, but on well, the same architecture of the model, but on the same input data several times, right? If you then, so then move around and like this latent space is not stable, then that's also something we don't want, right? So these are some of the things that, that we were looking at. Absolutely, that makes sense. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Babak, if you want to unmute and ask, you're welcome to, but I can also ask it for you. Oh, uh, sure, hi. Great talk. Uh, just a quick question. Did you also try to create null models for comparison with random configurations? So when you see null models, what do you mean um, exactly? Like the input of the data is coming from some sort of configurations that are representation of just a random input. Um, yeah, I mean, so we actually did that. We trained on um, where we take the data and then we shuffle it. So we basically yeah. completely shuffle the data and then we train on that, yeah. And then so you actually, see totally different latent space when you... Yeah, I, actually, I don't remember. We actually looked at the latent space because we use it for something a little bit different. I, I try to go on to that. Okay, all right, yeah. thanks. Yeah, um, so... Um, Okay, so this means that our model can learn all these rules, right? Rules about how do the different features interact with one another, but how can we get it out, right? So it's easy or easier to do if you just have, if you have like a, a supervised uh, model. I think it's a little bit easier, but here we had this like unsupervised model. We have this latent space, um, and so what we wanted to do is we wanted to see, okay, how does how does yeah could we somehow extract that information and to do that we uh, ended up using something called uh, virtual perturbations which we kind of borrowed a little bit from the uh, uh, single cell um, deep learning variation auto encoder uh, uh, area so <clears throat> basically um, what we do here is we, uh, you can uh, recall again we have like a, uh, the VE is a generative model so we have the encoder um, which encodes the data into the latent space. And we have the decoder, which um, uh, decodes the data, or which takes the, uh, the latent representation and then generates um, new data from that. So we kind of wanted to see if we could somehow use that. So what we do here is that, again, if you go back to our example from the beginning, we have here uh, input data and output data here. Imagine we trained the model. So then what we then do is then we say, okay, I just change one of these input features, put the data through again. What then happens here to the uh, reconstructions on the other side? And what this basically, what this basically mean is that, for instance, if we took, uh, or if we take, uh, changed one of the uh, um, inputs of the drug, or change the status of the drug for one of the patients from not getting the drug to getting the drug, we're basically asking the model what happens if we give uh, a drug to a patient. Um, and I think this is really, this was really uh, quite fun and very interesting. So what we end up doing then to be able to uh, do this is that when we have our trained model here, we pass the original data through. So we generate like a baseline reconstruction and we pass the perturbed data through. So we generate these uh, perturbed reconstructions. And then we want to figure out what's at significant associations um, from this uh, uh, perturbation by comparing the two, right? And to do this, we came up with two different methods. One is based on some t-testing heuristics and another one was based on uh, Bayesian decision theory. And I think, I don't know, in, in the interest of time, I think I'll skip the details a little bit. Um, but I just want to also mention that um, we are refitting the model or we have to retrain the model many times um, to be able to get very or to get more uh, precise estimates of the reconstructions. Um, uh, and this is also something that we um, benchmarked as well. And here, these are the details. I think I'll just uh, skip that um, and then go on to the results here um, where we then, so we then took also each of these or across these um, 700, uh, 800 uh, patients, they were taking 20 different types of drug, uh, drugs. And we then uh, perturbed each of, each of them one by one and tried to see which associations would, could we then identify. Um, 
And, and so across the board here, we, could, we think we can identify more associations uh, and also more uh, associations per drug. Um, <clears throat> then I want to show some examples here. So this is like within uh, an omics data set. So here we have the drugs down here on the x-axis and we have the um, uh, clinical features that are associated with at least one of these drugs here on the y-axis. And <clears throat> What here I what we um, I indicated here is uh, metformin, which is used to treat, uh, which is one of the uh, mostly used drugs to treat um, uh, high glucose levels in um, diabetes. And um, what we see here is that it's highly um, associated with the uh, the amount of mean glucose and also the uh, glucose uh, uh, sen sensitivity, which makes sense. But what we also see here is that it's actually in the opposite direction as what you would actually expect. And I think this is actually, I think uh, this is uh, actually really interesting because uh, this also shows the challenge of working with these kind of data because this is really uh, confounded by indication because treatment with metformin is actually based on um, uh, glucose um, levels in your blood, right? So it's actually like, so the higher, glucose levels you have, the more likely you are to actually be treated with it. So it actually learned this um, um, uh, clinical decision and, and, and with the setup we have, we cannot, we cannot actually resolve it. Was there a question? No, okay. So this was the case, I mean, here for uh, metformin. Then if, for instance, we look here for the statins, we have, um, um, which are used to treat uh, high cholesterol, they're, they're given two different types of statins. Here we see that they are associated with uh, fasting LDL and fasting cholesterol, which make perfect sense. This is actually what they are meant to uh, treat. So here, and this is also with the correct uh, orientation uh, of the associations. Similarly, we actually also see here that similar statin is associated with an increase in HDL and the HRI statin is associated with a decrease. And so they have opposite um, associations to this um, to this marker. And this is actually also known from uh, literature. So I think this is actually quite a uh, cool finding. And I also want to show this, this one here for metformin, um, um, where uh, we actually, so, so this, so uh, or here for uh, microbiome data, this is for uh, metformin again, where we see that it was associated with 14 different uh, microbes in the gut of these patients, or so changes in these levels, and three of these are known to be uh, 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 are known to be uh, changed by uh, metformin uh, ad administration, um, and these have been actually been find, found in randomized controlled trials. So this is and and also this is, and here we found it with the correct direction, right? So this this kind of um, um, interesting association here that here it actually finds what we uh, expect. Similar here with omer, uh, omeprazole, it, this is a protein pump inhibitor, so it increases the pH of your gut. And but what we find is that uh, increased uh, levels or uh, and uh, the model thinks that this will, if we give omer, omeprazole to an individual, this will increase the levels of um, uh, three um, uh, oral microbes in the uh, that are then able then to uh, transfer into the gut, and this also makes perfect sense. We can also look across data, and I think I uh, will not talk so much about that. But we can look across the omics data, both in terms of um, uh, how how many uh, uh, how many uh, features or uh, how large a fraction the data set is associated with drug changes. We see here that's quite different between the different data sets, but it's also quite different amounts of features in the um, in uh, in the data sets. We can look here at individual drugs. How what's the average uh, effect size across the data sets, and we can also rank them and see which ones are the most uh, similar uh, or has the uh, biggest effect. And also, I just wanted to sh to show this one here, which is like we can look at how similar is the um, is the perturbation of a drug to a perturbation of another drug in this omic space. And uh, we see here that, so here this is the uh, how uh, similar they are. And we see here, for, for instance, for paracetamol and codeine here, see these are the most similar ones. Um, we see the statins are the most dissimilar ones, but we also see like these 
patterns here of other um, clusters or small clusters uh, of drugs. And I think this is really an indication that um, uh, of this uh, uh, polypharmacy effect that we cannot actually not completely disentangle the effect uh, of all the drugs because they are um, many of them are given uh, together. Okay, so this would uh, I would like to conclude here for the super uh, unsupervised here. We can use it to learn structure of various data sets uh, also across um, uh, multimodal data. We can deal with missing data and confounders, and we can identify uh, these cross-modal feature uh, associations. And this is, uh, you can try it out and you can both uh, whenever you want and also here for the workshop later. Um, I also just briefly want to mention some perspectives here. So we have uh, for the supervised learning, I think this is like uh, kind of straightforward. I think um, it's very useful. We can do integration across diverse modalities. I think it will be very interesting interesting to see if we can add electronic health records into the into the mix and also include time as well. I think for the unsupervised learning, I think there's some something I would be very interested in is like trying to see if we can train these uh, foundation models. So these just like GPT uh, and is, is for text and so on. Um, so these very so these models that uh, are learning a lot on, on this kind of general uh, points. Um, for, uh, for instance, I mean, we train here on 700 patients. Imagine we can train from thousands, even hundreds of thousands of patients. They will probably not all have multi-omics data, but um, what we would then be able to do here is then we would be able to come with a new patient and then actually test what's the effect of a certain treatment in that patient, right? And I think uh, we could use that to guide what should, uh, how should I um, treat a certain patient? Um, and I think this even goes beyond finding a match. I mean, so it goes kind of beyond patient like me because we are learning from the entire uh, data, not just trying to find the individual that uh, looks the most like um, like me. Although, although, uh, would you agree that the me the metformin example highlights the challenge of of um, interpreting uh, any of these things causally uh, in the 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 phrasing in, in that bullet, what is the effect of treatment is that you would, you want to have a causal interpretation, of course, for that patient, but you you, you can't necessarily do that from from observational data or, or if you do, it might be kind of fraught. I uh, I 100 percent agree. I think there's needs to be a lot of work done to try to figure that out. I mean, and I would be very interested in um, discussing that with someone if uh, other people are interested in that. Sorry, related to that point, uh, is yep. it possible if we resolve the collinearity between the predictors, um, there will be less of this confounding and uh, we could go more in the direction of causality? Or yeah, do we I have think, to take all the predictor variables? Yeah, I think uh, we didn't do that um, at all. And that's something that we are looking into because I think you're right that that uh, uh, will also uh, make it a little bit easier uh, for the model to learn, right? So I think definitely. That's a very good idea. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge, I mean, people from the from my group and also for the so for the first paper, it was really driven by Anwar Sigurdsson. Uh, we had a lot of help from Biani Williamson in Aarhus University, Ole Winter and Ole Lund, uh, Ole Winter from KU, Ole Lund from DTU, Sam Brunak here from also the NNF CPI, and also uh, from the DBDS consortium to use the data for uh, evaluation. And as similar for the MOVE paper, um, the entire direct consortium, a lot of people in both my group and Charles group, uh, Rosa, Alice, who did a lot of, um, of the work for that, Ricardo, um, and, uh, Oneida, and, and so on, and funding uh, here from the No Noise Foundation, and also the direct was funded by European um, Initiative. And yeah, you can catch me as well, also on email and on Twitter. And if you have any more questions, I'm happy to take that. Fantastic, Simon. Thank you so much.